your way in, you were handed a uh, little attendance uh, card and a questionnaire. Um, I ask you all to take the time to fill that out. That's helpful for us in terms of trying to get a head count. It's also useful for us if um, any of your professors incentivize you to attend today, right? We'll make sure that they'll get that information. Uh, the questionnaire is also useful for us, though, just in terms of giving us feedback, right? Trying to help us to identify what, what speakers you like and, and how to improve upon things. Uh, there's there are boxes on the table on, on the way out, so we ask you to drop the attendance cards and the um, questionnaires in there, uh, and we'll, we'll take them from there. For those of you who do not know me, um, I'm Peter Calcanum, Director of the Initiative for Public Choice and Market Process. And I want to tell you the uh, mission of the Initiative for Public Choice and Market Process is to advance the understanding of the economic, political, and moral foundation of free society. We try to do this by engaging in activities such as today with speaker series. We offer faculty research, student research opportunities, and um, something that will be of interest to you coming up is we always do a week-long um, series of Adam Smithley variety of presentations, and there are schedules for Adam Smithley coming up. Uh, shortly after spring break, so grab one of those on your way out, see a variety of activities that we have going on. Today, we have the great pleasure of having Professor Deidre McCloskey. Professor McCloskey was trained at Harvard University. She taught 12 years um, in the economics department at the University of Chicago. In around 1980, she became interested in the rhetoric of, and persuasion in economics, and then literary matters such as literary and social theory. Over her career, she has written over 14 books and edited seven more. And she has written over 300 articles on economic theory, economic history, philosophy, rhetoric, feminism, ethics, and law. Her main project for the next few years is a six volume set that she's currently working on, on a tome called Bourgeoisie Era. Uh, volumes one and two are out. She's currently working on volume three. First volume was Bourgeoisie Virtue, second is Bourgeoisie, Bourgeoisie Dignity. Um, which is going to talk with us a little bit about that. Since 2000, she's been a distinguished professor of economics, history, English, communications at the University of uh, Illinois, Chicago. And today she's going to persuade us why non Austrian economics cannot explain the modern world. And with that, I give you Professor McCloskey. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a speech defect, which you'll you, you, you'll notice, believe me. So it's a free country, you know. If you can't stand it, if it drives you crazy, you can run screaming from the room. That's okay, I won't break down crying or anything. I'm an economist by um, training, as Pete observed. And being an economist, the old joke is being an economist means answering supply and demand to every question. Why do people get married? Supply and demand. Why does, uh, I don't know, why do you eat hamburgers? Supply and demand. And my, my point this afternoon is going to be that supply and demand doesn't explain why we're so rich. Now, I don't want you to get the impression that I think economics is a stupid subject or that everything that you learn about supply and demand curves is wrong. That's not true. In fact, I'm, I'm working right now with my, my graduate students on a third edition of a microeconomics book that I did a long time ago. The last edition was 1985. Despite that long gap, it's a, it's a very good book. It's called the Applied Theory of Price. It's available free as a, as, a, as a PDF on my website, so you can go examine it. And that book is all about supply and demand, things you've heard in your economics courses. Uh, uh, opportunity cost, marginal cost, marginal benefit, marginal utility, marginal this and marginal that. And, and the idea of marginalism, which is an invention of the 18, 1870s. It was simultaneous, simultaneously discovered 
in Austria, in Switzerland, and in England, is that you do things up to the point where the marginal benefit right, uh, falls, has fallen, to the point at which th that becomes equal to a rising marginal cost. So I just had a pulled beef sandwich at, uh, where was the place? Nick's Barbecue, it's very nice. And um, each bite that I had, the first bite was really good. The second bite was good. Third bite was good minus. Fourth bite was fair plus. And then I stopped when the, the, the diminishing returns, we say, had gotten to the point where the, where the cost met. Now, since it was free, and Pete supplied it, it was not a matter of cash payment. But it was a payment in term of, terms of love handles and various other costs of life in this, this rich world. And so I stopped. And that doesn't mean I didn't enjoy the, the sandwich. I did. I told you the first bite I liked very much, second, third. So there was a net benefit, a marginal net benefit, for each bite I took right down to the last. Right? See? Watch, watch. And that ooh <laughs> is the essential idea in economics. It's the most basic idea in economics for the last 100 and, uh, 130 years. And you can use it for all kinds of things. And you economics majors learn how to bore your roommates with further demonstrations of how everything's about ooh, everything's about marginal benefit and marginal cost. And you go around saying that all the time because you've been uh, Pete has told you to. Um, and I approve. That's good. So I'm not against economics. But there's a big problem. And that is that we're very rich, and once we were very poor. How rich? Very, very rich. Look, in 1800, the average person in the world, Africa, Asia, North South America, Australia, I don't care, Europe, the United States, was earning about $3 a day in present day Charleston prices. Now suppose you had to live in Charleston on $3 a day. Think about it. Would that buy you? I don't know the prices here, but they must be something like Chicago. That would get you, let's see, three quarters of a cappuccino, maybe. Is that about right? OK, three quarters of a cappuccino and nothing else. No pulled beef, no apartment, no clothing, no education. That's what you got, three bucks, that's it. Every day, three bucks, three bucks, three bucks. Now, place like England, or indeed the United States by them, but especially England and Holland, and some parts of China, some parts of Japan, had higher than $6 a day. I mean, sorry, $3 a day. They had $6 a day. Well, as my mother always says in these contexts, she's 89, so she has all these phrases from long ago. She says, $6 a day is no bag of bluebirds either. <laughs> now, I don't know what's so nice about a bag of bluebirds, <laughs> but that's what she says. It's no bag of bluebirds, by which she means it's not, not so grand. OK, it's not $3 a day, or the $1 a day on which many hundreds of millions of people in the world still survive, $1 a day. One dollar a day is uh, sleeping on the streets of Calcutta of a night, uh, not getting three quarters of a cappuccino, getting one quarter of a cappuccino, and that's it. 
So you're very thin, and you're very sick, and your children don't survive for long. And it's hard to get pregnant because you're infertile, and so on and so forth. Now, what's, why do I say we're rich? You may say, oh, I'm a student. I'm poor. I live in this crummy apartment, and we only have, uh, you know, the four of us, we only have 2,500 square feet of apartment. We're practically starving. I mean, do you know how much a pizza cost in Charleston? And my car, my car, I can't, you know, God, it costs so much gasoline. Well, the average person in the United States now, every man, woman, and child, if you average it over, $130 a day. $3 or 6 and 130 it's a hell of a change, a hell of a change. Now, I look around this room, and I don't see any, maybe I'm wrong, you, you tell me. I don't see any descendants of the crowned heads of Africa or Europe or Latin America or Asia. I don't see any Habsburg chins. Have anyone descended from the Habsburgs in, in Europe here? So. Maybe there were some people back in 1800 who were doing well. If they owned a plantation with 100 slaves, that'd be a very, very, very large plantation. Then they were doing pretty well. If they were the king of France, well, in 1800 they weren't doing so well, but in, in 1700. But even the king of France in 1700, Louis XIV, he didn't have smallpox inoculation. He didn't have uh, large pieces of plate glass, so lots of his windows were open. In the great palace of Versailles that, that Louis XIV had built, do you know how they went to the bathroom? They had no flush toilets. So if you wanted to relieve yourself, man or woman, you, not, I'm not making this up, you went into the hallway and did it. So you can imagine the state of the hallways in the Palace of Versailles. When he went in a coach, this is the Sun King himself, the top of the pops, the great, the, the great power in, in, in Europe, the, the greatest monarch in, in Europe, not in the world, that was in, in China, but in, you know, he, was in, he was wonderful. When he went on a ride, he was pulled by horses in a carriage, and the carriage went like this. So he, the carriage was unheated. Now you drive in your wonderful General Motors car, or still better, Toyota, <laughs> and your air conditioning, you know, switch your music whenever you want it, smooth ride. Even poor people in the United States are better off than $3 a day, and they're a lot better off than the average person in the United States as late as 1900 or 19, 1920. Poor people I'm talking about. Look, so what's the explanation for this? Here's how it goes. Here's how it goes. Look, this is a very accurate scientific diagram. My finger. I'm an economist. Don't try this at home. <laughs> My finger has a miraculous ability to draw scientific diagrams very accurately. Every little bump I make is scientifically significant. So let's start with average income over here. Back 120,000 years ago in Africa. By the way, everyone in this room is in Africa. You got that straight? Everyone here came from Africa, so let's, let's get that clear. OK, here we are. Here's zero, let's, so that you can all see it. I'll make zero right here. Well, that's going to make it hard, but OK. Here's zero. Zero income per day. Well, that's not, you're not going to do very well with zero income per day. No food, you're going to starve. 
So that's not going to work out. So it has to be $3 a day. And watch. Now you have to watch this or you're not going to get the point. See this amount? About an inch? That I'm going to call $3 a day. That's how the scale is going to be. Okay, we're off, off to the races here. Well, I say 120,000 years ago because it appears on current archaeological and, and genetic evidence that that's about when language came to be in a form that we would recognize full language. About, and, and, we, 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 and we know where it happened. It happened in uh, s s southeastern Africa. So here we are going along at $3 a day. If I tend to drift up or down, that's just because I, well, something's gone wrong with my finger. Here it is. It's going along $3 a day, $3 a day, $3 a day. Why is, why is it always $3 a day? Well, because if it's any lower, you all starve to death. You have all your children die before they get to maturity. None of of the women are fertile because they're, they're starving and their reproductive um, um, systems uh, um, shut down. So if it's much below three, the population can't sustain itself. On the other hand, if they discover some new technology like the bow and arrow, so now, hey, we can kill more animals, yay, um, then they have a food surplus population goes up and because of what you learned in your economics course about diminishing marginal returns to land as the population goes up the amount that the last person can earn goes down it stands stands to reason if it's hunting certainly it's true if it's agriculture but that's way in the future still but if it's hunting gathering you know once you've gathered the seeds in the area if you have a family twice as large, you have to get twice as many seeds. You have to go further and further from the campsite to get the seeds. And there you are. You're diminishing returns. So if the population starts going up, then yield goes down. And you start to lose population. So if, you're, if, if you go way down, goes way below $3 a day, people die off. And because of this diminished returns argument, it gets easier to earn your living, right? So population goes back up again. If you go way over $3 a day, it gets easier to earn your, it gets harder to earn your, earn your living, and population goes down. It's exactly like the thermostat in this room. It's the Malthusian thermostat after a man named Malthus, an, an economist, an English economist named Malthus, who made this point in 1798. Keep that number in mind for a second. OK, here we go. We're going along, and you know, here we are about, let's see, that's 120. Here we are. About here is the invention of agriculture, the domestication of plants and animals. Horses are domesticated here. Dogs are the first to be domesticated, so far as animals are concerned. Chickens are <coughs> domesticated in China. Sheep are domesticated in the Middle East. Wheat in the Middle East. Rice in China, perhaps in, 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 in South China. All those. There's this, and this, this is a puzzle. I just thought of this puzzle last week. <laughs> this is a puzzling feature of this story. Why did humans only domesticate in this rather small window from about 12,000 BCE when they start domesticating dogs to, I don't know, 4,000 BCE when the horse is domesticated north of the, uh, of the Black Sea in, in what's now um, Ukraine? That's a pretty, that's 8,000 years. Yet most of the domestication everywhere was done then. The Incas, not the Incas exactly, but the people of what's now Peru and Ecuador, 
domesticated corn, uh, not corn, um, um, potatoes about then, about 4,000 BCE. And corn was domesticated in, in, in Central America about then. In New Guinea, in far New Guinea, un, unattached any of these other places, no one was going to New Guinea anymore, and they certainly weren't coming from it. In New Guinea, they started to, they, they started to have agriculture about them. So there's something a little spooky about this, a little weird. But anyway, that's not my main story. Because when they domesticate potatoes, the potato is a wonderful um, uh, vegetable, very I mean it is. It's um, very easy to plant. It's, you can't kill it practically. And, you, know, you get a lot of nutrients from it. The Irish diet around 1800 of potatoes and milk was ideal. <laughs> it had all the, all the nutrients that you needed. Potatoes and milk meant that Irish people were, or my ancestors, were, had the tallest men, and I must say, the most beautiful women in London, where they had gone because there was nothing to do in Ireland. <laughs> my ancestors came to the United States because there was nothing to do in Ireland. Okay, but but when you invent when you when you domesticate the potato, which of course didn't get to Europe until after 1492, there was of course an upsurge in population. You start to be able to have big populations in one place instead of having to spread them around because of these diminishing returns to land. But of course, bigger populations, diminishing returns to land. So the people end up at the thermostat level every time. The population thermostat level of about $3 a day, even after the invention of agriculture. It's not a permanent gain, at least so far as the average welfare of the average person is concerned. Now, now it's an advantage to us, we at the end of this process, because it made um, settlements possible. Then it made towns possible. Um, Jericho in Israel was first settled in 8,000 BCE, a long time ago. It made towns possible, then great, 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 great uh, cities. And that caused the invention of writing. And that caused civilization. It's called civilization because the Latin for because of the Latin for, 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 for a citizen of a town. So it was a good thing, but it didn't make people any better off materially. They were still stuck at $3 a day. It would go up and then go down, back to three. Three, now watch, watch. You're going to miss the whole point of, of the lecture if you don't watch very carefully. Now we're at 1800. Now watch. Pay your attention. And it goes, whoosh. hear that. It goes from $3 a day to $130 a day in some countries, or $6 a day to $130 a day in the United States in 200 years. 200 years is trivial by comparison with the <laughs> length of time that Homo sapiens sapiens, that's us, have been on the, on the planet, which is something not too far before this 100, 120 years thousand years I'm talking about. So we have a highly sophisticated technical term for this event in economic history. We call it the hockey stick. <laughs> I know this, put that down, it's very, very high-level high science here. The handle of the, this is not a field hockey stick, this is an ice hockey stick. The handle of the hockey stick is very, very long and then in 1800, it shoots up. The sound's quite important. Nowadays, it's spreading to the whole world. China and India are doing the Income has been growing in China since 1978 at upwards of 10% a year per capita. 
people have heard the law, the rule of 72. How many people in this class know that? Put your hands up higher so I can actually count it. Okay, I can, I can educate you. Something growing at 1% a year doubles in 72 years, right? I, you, 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 you don't have to do the calculation, I'm asserting that. Something that grows at 1% a year, a tree or a bank fund or anything else, will get twice as t large as it was at the beginning if it's growing at one in, in, in 72 years. That's just a fact of mathematics. Now I ask you, what if something is growing at 2% at two how many years will it take to double? 36. Why is that? Because it's got to be half uh, since you've doubled the rate, the speed with which you're running, you're going to cover the same distance in half the time. Now, I'm, I was once a long distance runner. I call it race staggering. This was very slow. I ran very slowly. But if I ran twice as fast, I'd cover the mile in half the time, obviously. So you can keep doing this. You say, well, let's see. Suppose you're, it's 4% a year. Well, that means it doubles in, let's see, 4 goes into 6.25. Is that right? Is that right? 18. Yeah, 18. Sorry, I can't do uh, mathematics very well. 18, roughly 18. Or, yeah, no, exactly 18. 8% uh, a year. Doubles, therefore, every uh, every nine years. Ten percent a year. Well, you can see what the formula is. <laughs> Take seventy-two, divide the rate of growth in percentage terms, and you get the number of years it takes to double. So, if if China's growing at ten percent a year, divide ten into seventy-two, you get seven point two years. That means that in a generation of roughly 21 years, you get 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. So you get a factor of 8. Your children earn 8 times more in real terms than you do. Now that's significant social and economic change. And that's what's been happening in China. Now, they started not at $3 a day, but more like $1 a day. But it's been going on. Now, China is earning $20 a day, which is you know, still below the, below the world average, which is about $30 a day. But they're, they're going to catch up quite soon. And it's way below the American of $130 a day. But still, it's, it's good. And thank God. <laughs> I was so depressed by this, because China was growing like mad. And India was not. India was still in the period of what they called the license raj, where to do anything, you had to get permission of the government, which meant that someone's hand was out to be bribed to allow you permission. You want to, you want to start a business? You want to have some electricity? You want to have some water? You want to have chairs? You want to be alive? <laughs> Pile, 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 pile. It wasn't very good for business. OK. After 1991, India started doing the same thing that China did. It freed up the economy. It allowed people to start, start, start businesses when they wanted to, invest here or there as they feel. In a way, China, though it still calls itself communist, is one of the largest <coughs> capitalist economies in the world. OK. So this which started out in places like Holland and England in the, in the 1700s and what became the United States um, now is, is spreading to the world. In 100 years, maybe even in 50 years, everyone in the world will have an income level like the United States. And that's very good news. There's all this silly fear about China is rising. Ah! 
the rise of the blob. The blob is coming. China is going to take over the world. Oh, the Chinese, they're getting rich. Oh, that's terrible, that's terrible, that's terrible. No, it's not. It's good for us. It's good to have skilled, well-managed, inventive neighbors. Because then you get the advantage of the skilled, well-managed inventions that they make. And that's been happening now for, for, for two centuries. All the boats rise eventually. Eventually, not immediately. There's still terribly poor places like Chad. It's very poor. OK. Now, why did this happen? Well, my economics colleagues want it to be investment. Because we understand investment in economics really well. You can also call it accumulation. Accumulation of, what do you accumulate? Capital. So their claim is that the reason we're rich is that we have so much more capital than our ancestors had. So many more classrooms, so many more houses, so many more automobiles. They didn't have many in 1800. So many more houses, so many more streets, so many more machines, blah, 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 blah. Or, recently, my colleagues have said, well, maybe it's not physical capital. It's human capital. So BAs, MBAs, LLBs, PhDs, high school diplomas, that's what causes modern economic growth. So that's my economist, my sort of usual economist colleague. The way I was trained, the way I've taught, it's accumulation, dear. We're rich because we piled up a bunch of stuff. My, my Marxist friends, and I have lots of Marxist friends, they say, yeah, it's accumulation, but the accumulation came from exploiting people. It came from the slave trade, or it came from exploiting the third world, or it came from exploiting the poor people. My more conservative friends, no, no, the accumulation comes from saving. So saving, exploitation. Some say saving, some say exploitation. One person says saving, the other says exploitation. One says exploitation, the other says saving. Both of them are wrong. Accumulation has nothing to do with it, or very little to do with it. Accumulation is pretty easy to do. Look. They built the Grand Canal in China, the longest canal in the world, a thousand years ago. They built the Great Wall of China starting almost 2,000 years ago. They, um, they built the pyramids. The Romans built roads all over the place that were, are in some parts of, uh, of Europe virtually still in use. Uh, getting the savings, whether by being very careful and not spending a lot, as my conservative friends say, or being really mean and stealing it from people, as my le left-wing friends say, neither of those is, is relevant because accumulation is not what caused it. What it caused our increase in income. What caused our income was better ideas. It was intellectual. Look around you. Cheap steel, cheap wood, Cheap, extant electricity, air conditioning, that has made the, the South, by the way. You know, um, Charleston, in 1950, was really uncomfortable for about half the year. Um, weaving machines that can make carpeting like this, and enormous pieces. Now, I don't think this, ha this thing has any seams. This is one piece of carpet. You couldn't do this with hand methods. You need gigantic looms, looms actually the size of this room. And those, those were ideas. Then it was easy to get the investment, one way or another, to implement the ideas. To put it another way, if all we had was accumulation, and we didn't have any new ideas, 
very quickly, the return on the ideas we used would get down to zero. There'd be diminishing returns. There it is again, to investment. And we'd be down at $3 a day again. So then the question is, well, Mrs. McCluskey, if you're so smart, why did the ideas happen? Because one of the basic problems with this whole puzzle, and the reason I emphasize how long we are at $3 a day, is that it's only here that it changes. We had property rights before. What you mean by a, a, a civilization is you have property rights. We had um, big organized governments before. That can't be it. People could read before, not too many, but lots of them. So there's something very fishy that it's ordinary economics, supply and demand, supply and demand. Something very fishy with the proposition that ordinary economics, foreign trade, or uh, rises in the savings rate, or uh, uh, I don't know, investing in the brass industry, caused such a remarkable, completely unprecedented change. So what? It has to be ideas. Where do the ideas come from? Why didn't the ideas happen earlier? After all, the Greeks invented a lot. They invented drama. They invented mathematics, as we understand it, as a matter of proof. They invented philosophy. They invented rhetoric. They invented history. They invented a lot of things, those ancient Greeks. The Chinese. Up until really around 1700, you'd have to have been crazy to bet on the Europeans as the place where the whoosh would happen. Because the most innovative people on earth were the Chinese and have been for millennia. The conventional remark is that they invented paper. They were using paper for clothing. of the common era. That'd make cheating on an exam very easy to just write. Uh, <laughs> they had, they, um, they invented, um, the, they found the compass, the principle of the compass, hundreds of years before it was used in Europe. They invented gunpowder. And they and the Mongols were using gunpowder to fight with each other in the 12th uh, century. They invented the blast furnace, which for a long time we thought was a Swedish invention. They invented this, they invented that. They were using natural gas for lighting early in the first millennium. So you'd think China would be the place, or maybe Japan, which had Chinese um, civilization. Well, <laughs> no, it turned out to be Northwestern Europe. Why? Pourquoi? Perché? Because the Northwestern Europeans discovered liberty. And they discovered dignity for ordinary people. Those two things. The result was that entrepreneurs, inventors, were able to innovate Whereas it was commonplace to find that if you invented something, threw people out of work, you would be thrown over a cliff by the, the, the sultan or something. In 16th century Augsburg, which is in Germany, a man invented a ribbon loom for making ribbon, you know, for your hair or something. And this was going to throw a lot of ribbon weavers out of work. So the council of Augsburg voted to have the man secretly drowned in the local river. And that put an end to innovation in ribbon making in Augsburg. People who already had a good deal going were able politically to stop 
what was famously what is famously called creative destruction. The, the same thing, by the way, started happening in Europe in the arts. If you compare European music, if you take, say, European music in 1300, European mu music in 1500, European music in 1700, European music in 1900, not to speak of 2012, you observe accelerating innovation. My favorite example, if you're a jazz fan, is, is um, Charlie Parker, who after the Second World War, he and some other people changed jazz. Jazz was once swing music for a number of years, it had been that, and Charlie Parker put out of business a lot of swing jazz musicians. Well, that's what innovation does. Innovation puts the old way of earning your living out of business. And so people in that business don't like it. So it's crucial, this change in attitude, because it allowed people to sort of agree, as it were, kind of constitutional agreement, to not attack people who are innovative. And so there is a sociological change in dignity and honor for inventors. And there's a political change in freedom to invent. And those two made the modern world. What happened is that this, this old mechanism, this Malthusian me mechanism, this diminishing return stuff stopped being important. What happened is that innovation started happening so fast that it overwhelmed diminishing returns. At the same time that income per head was going up by this gigantic amount, population increased by a factor by now of seven. In 1800, the population of the world was one billion people, a lot of folks. But now it's seven billion people. And completely contrary to what in environmentalists tend to fear, the increasing population resulted in higher per capita income, not lower. So contrary to all the experience of the handle, the blade of the hockey stick, which more and more people, more and more countries are, are, are joining, praise the Lord, um, has been overcome. There is no longer a handle, it's we're on the blade. So you can see, and here I'll end, you can see that I'm an optimist. You can't change gender without being an optimist. That's <laughs> my view of the matter. I'm an optimist. I think that, as I said, soon we'll all be rich. And by the way, the part of the world that will be the most innovative in 100 years will be Africa. That's because African genes are more varied than Asian or European or Middle Eastern or other kinds of genes. Because everyone in this room, except people with African, uh, 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 African uh, heritage, um, came from 1,000 lines, 1,000 individuals who came out of Africa at various times. Whereas, and it's simply a fact, it's a fact of a completely uncontroversial fact that there's more variation, genetic variation in Africa. So, that, so, for example, the tallest people in the world and the shortest people in the world, if they're properly fed, are in Africa, right? Um, so it's going to be, this, this is going to be a wonderful kind of irony, <laughs> a repaying of the Europeans and the Asians for their, for their nasty racism about pe 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 people with African backgrounds, that the Einsteins and the Mozarts of the 22nd century are going to be mainly black. Too bad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I'm not 
saying that we're going to decline or anything like that. As I said before, it's a good thing when people prosper. When your neighbors are well off, you are too. Economic growth, not on, this, not on the blade of this hockey stick, has been nothing like zero sum. That China gets better off or that Sub-Saharan Africa gets better off is good news for everyone on the planet. So, in your lifetimes, probably not in mine, well, I think you know, it's become obvious to me right now, and I'm only, only 69. I got, God, I got, hey, two more years to live. <laughs> um, you, in your lifetimes, you'll start seeing this if we don't screw it up. It was happening, it looked very promising in 1914, and then we, or the Europeans and in particular, screwed it up and started a European civil war that asked it lasted essentially till 1989. Um, let's not do that again, I advise us. Let's not repeat the horrors of the 20th century. But even in that 20th century, we continued to grow, particularly um, after the Second World War. And now we're growing like mad worldwide. It's a good thing. Things are going to get better and better. We aren't ever going to grow like China does because China's uh, all catching up to us. But in short, be of good cheer. You may have a hard time getting a job next year. But in the long run, you're all going to do fine. Your income's not going to be lower than what your parents was on average. Relax. There is a famous poster that the British had made up in 1942 when it was a realistic possibility that the Germans were going to invade Britain and take it over because their army was vastly superior to anything that the British had. So they made up a poster. Red, let's see, it's red with white lettering saying, keep calm and carry on. This is frightfully British. Stiff upper lip and all that old beam. And they, but they didn't distribute it. It was going to be distributed if the Germans invaded. They were going to post them up all over the country. Keep calm and carry on. Carry on the fight on the landing fields and so forth. But then there's now a website where you can go and get little or big posters, keep calm and carry on. And I hand them out to my friends, framed versions of these. Because it's very comforting. Keep calm and carry on. That's my bottom line. Thank you. I'll be glad to answer questions. So that they can hear. Do you think it will take some kind of geopolitical shift or, I don't know, return to the Enlightenment or something, I don't know, for, um, for us to re embrace in our civilization, Western civilization, the idea of innovation and rewarding people who do things differently? No. It'll take the publication of my books. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here's one, the, the Bourgeois Virtues, available cheap on Amazon.com. Wonderful book, 500 pages. I've stopped, once I knew how to write short books, then word processing came and I'd gone completely mad. So this is volume one. Volume two, which is what I've been t talking about uh, this afternoon, it's called Bourgeois Dignity, Why Economics Can't Explain the Modern World. I'm working on um, the treasured bourgeoisie, how innovation became virtuous, 1600 to 1848, 
And then volume four is going to be bourgeois rhetoric, language and interests in the era of the Industrial Revolution. Then I'll have four, nice design with them, and I'll have a boxed set. And I will die happy, like Harry Potter. <laughs> if, I earn, if I earn one hundredth of what she earned in that book, I'll die rich, too. But anyway, that's why I wrote the book. That's why I'm working on this, and why a few other people are, too, a number of other people. Because the one danger is it will undermine this ideology, uh, what I call the bourgeois deal. You let, you let me innovate, make up new ways of doing things. Don't try to stop me. Don't, don't put me in jail or throw me in the throw me in the river, drown me in the river. You let me do it, and I'll make this very valuable uh, personal pronoun you have in the South. You all rich. I'll make you all rich. That's the deal. Whereas if you don't do the deal, if you say, oh no. Oh, no, I'm not going to let you become rich. Don't let me hear you talk about any innovations around here. We've got our way of doing things. Shut up, or I'll throw you over the cliff. And I have the cops to do it. The Walt Disney Corporation just succeeded in extending copyright because the copyright on Mickey Mouse was about to run out. And they said, no way, we're going we're to stop this. So they went to Congress, and they bought it for a surprisingly low price and got Congress to extend copyright. That's exactly the kind of thing we've got to stop happening. So that's why I wrote the books. It's ideology that can kill us. Yeah? Speak loudly so that I can hear over here. Yeah? to the government. If they can't get to the government, then they can get to the government. But if they can't get to the government, then they can't make it illegal to copy Mickey Mouse or make it illegal to reproduce a cancer drug. Um, and if they can't do that, then they're out of luck. They're, they're not going to be able to stop innovation because each of them will say, we can make a lot of money on this new cancer drug because we, we, we came to it first. We were smart. We, we got to it first. And these other people can try to do the, uh, do the chemical engineering to make it in a massive scale, but it's going to take them years to do it, and it will for most innovations. So I do not believe that there's a big role for the government in encouraging innovation. Interesting historical example is France. In the, in the 1700s, France, as it always is, was constantly trying, the government was trying to make the economy work better. So, there were, so the French government offered a bunch of prizes for various kinds of inventions. Britain, no prizes. No prizes. If you, they, they, they said, look, if you can make some money at it, go ahead. If a se separate condenser for the steam engine makes sense, you try it out, feel free. Which group? Britain did. Britain had the, if, if there hadn't been a Britain, <laughs> if it had gone beneath the sea or something, there wouldn't have been an industrial revolution. Because the French were trying to do it with rationality. Whereas rationality is not the way forward in an economy. Evolution is. Trying out a bunch of stuff. Here, here's an amazing fact. Every year in American grocery stores, hear this figure, 
10,000 new products are introduced. Now, you don't see them in your store, or you'd go mad, you wouldn't even know where anything was. But if, if you add up all the trials in all the submarkets in the United States, it's 10,000 a year. How many of them end up permanently on the shelf? Maybe 100, maybe 200 per year. That's it. So trying out stuff and allowing, allowing profit and loss to the customer. I had a friend in advertising, poor man early in his career, he had the fruit float account. Now you won't know about fruit float, but it was a canned um, English dessert. It's called a trifle. And it's somewhat disgusting even when it's made well. And this was canned. You opened the can and plopped it on the plate, and then you had a fruit float. And this stuff was just terrible. Um, and he couldn't get anyone to buy it. He also had the Pringles New Fashion Potato Chips account. Now, Pringles now is OK. He eat Pringles Potato Chips. I try not to. But eat Pringles Potato Chips, they taste like potato chips. Right? I'm telling you. In 1968, they tasted like cardboard. <laughs> and my poor, poor, poor Rick had to try to sell this stuff. And he could get people to buy it once, and then they never bought another can of Pringles newfangled potato chips again. So that's how the economy goes. That's how the arts go. That's how the sciences go. That's how scholarship goes. You let people try out a bunch of stuff, and the successful stuff, stuff that people buy, makes it to the top. That's how we progress. That's how we pr 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 progress biologically. It's also how we pr progress economically. Yeah? I'm curious to hear what you thought about uh, the digital house. Yeah. Why is that instead of that, that they get the technology for producing these amounts that they want to create it? It's kind of like you're going halfway across the right I am. I, that, because I don't think there should be property rights and ideas. As we were saying at lunch, it's kind of a c close call. It's a balance. Because I can see, I can see room for a short patents, short copyrights, you know, five years, 10 years, something like that. Cool, I don't mind that. But I think it's crazy to have, how is it now life plus 70 years or 40 years or some, it's gigantic. It makes no sense. So, so th there's always a trade-off there. Once the bridge has been built, the marginal cost of going over the bridge is zero. You somehow have to get the bu bridge built. So maybe you'll want to charge tolls for a while, <clears throat> maybe. But the socially op after the bridge is in existence, the socially optimal price for crossing the bridge is its marginal opportunity cost, which if, it, if it's a non-congested bridge is zero or nearly zero. And there's no, there's no trick to answer that. There's no blackboard diagram I can draw that'll answer that and won't. But what appears to be the case is that you can get an awful lot of innovation without copyrights and without patents. Let me hear from you. Can you uh, differentiate how Austrian economics describes Keynesian or Marxist? Um, Keynesian, Marxist, Samsonian, Old institutionalists, neo institutionalists, there are a whole bunch of other things. They don't do it. Austrian economics does. Because Austrian economics emphasizes innovation. Israel Kirzner is the big theorist of this. Um, by the way, Israel is also a very prominent rabbi. He's now quit being a professor of economics to be full time as a rabbi. But in any case, his, his his argument is that there's, there's an alertness that entrepreneurs need to have. And that's the key. That's the big deal. That's what makes us rich. That would, that's what takes us out of $3 a day, puts us into 130 So I, I think Austrian economics is the way to go. Not more of this supply and demand stuff, as good as it is for the short run, or the medium run. Now, I believe this stuff. I think it's great. Why demands? Why demands? It's not the explanation for the most fundamental 
change in the, our condition. You've already had a question. Let's go to someone else before we go back to you. Yeah. supposed to get rid of the cotton subsidies, the cotton protection. It is outrageous that the, the, the Sahel in Africa, which is a good place to grow cotton, isn't the place where we grow cotton. It's crazy that we're not growing oranges in Mexico or Central America. Instead, we're growing them in California with subsidized water. Well, Water for farming in, or let's express it the other way, water for drinking water or for toilets in private houses sells for six times more than the same water used for agriculture in California. Californian agriculture is way too big. It's absurd. It's being subsidized massively. So we get rid of all that. We, we, we stop. Look, sugar. Sugar is a big problem. Here's why it's a big problem. Here are the states. Hawaii, Florida, Louisiana, North Dakota, Colorado. What do those states have in common? Well, they got two things in common. They all make sugar. The first three make cane sugar. The last two make beet sugar. We could get the sugar for half what we're paying. Not that, you know, that'd be bad for me, I have to admit. But, but uh, so, it, so we got to get, th these are sometimes kind of minor. Um, sugar's not that big a deal. But we certainly don't need government choosing winners. Government is not well equipped to decide that environmental industries should get subsidies. It's just not good at it. Because, you know, well, take, take the case of, um, of, uh, of ethanol from corn. This is real, this is really stupid. We should be using the corn to feed, uh, feed poor people in the world, not to make fuel that we can get just as easily from Canada or Saudi Arabia. Um, it's a real stupid thing to do. And we got to stop thinking that there are wise people. We have to go back to this evolutionary idea. That there's a takeaway. That it's not rationality that makes us superior to our, our ancestors. We're not more, we're not smarter than they are. We're, we, we are better informed, I agree, but we're not smart. It's that we've allowed people to experiment for two centuries. And that's why we have all this stuff. That's why we're able, the ancestors of everyone here worked in the field or the garden or the, or, or the kitchen all day long. It's what your great, 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 great grandparents did. Everyone here, most of them couldn't read unless you came from Scandinavia. Most of them couldn't read. My Irish ancestors couldn't read. And look at us now, <laughs> of a Thursday afternoon, having a philosophical discussion about economic growth. Thank you very much.